This episode of the Southern Hemisphere No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Activista. Activista's mission is to assist growers to develop soil-focused, diverse cropping systems with commercially viable seeds, appropriate equipment and soil inputs, and advice and feedback for all growers' current needs and particular situations. Activista is working diligently behind the scenes to maintain and develop their supply of seeds for profitable market farming. Small bulk quantities are at or near cost price. They have a non-GMO pledge and aim to source the best hybrid and heritage varieties to suit each segment and conditions of growers' needs nationally. Activista takes the battle out of importing specialized tools, providing sales and warranty support with all of their equipment range. They carry most, if not all, parts and have a direct line of communication with suppliers. Activista encourages customer feedback and gives personal attention to all inquiries as they see this process as a vital part of our vibrant, developing, organic community. This next episode is also brought to you by Curly's Ag. Curly's Ag has been in the business of developing and manufacturing innovative ag tools for the past five years. In that short time, they have amassed an impressive range of new and patented tools now readily available for you. Curly's Ag is home to the world's only commercially available battery drill-powered power harrow, as well as Curly's Cracker 2, an automatic broad fork making saw prep and ease in any condition. Curly's Ag is also known for the Elia 3000, a multi-purpose tilter, mulcher and bed former all rolled into one, as well as the most recent and anticipated tool for every farm, the Handy. The Handy is redefining the market garden toolkit and taking the hard work out of farming. It can lift 300 kilograms of these and smoothly manoeuvre over your garden bed without damaging crops. The Handy's PDO powers the Elia 6000, Mulcher and Tilther, a power harrow, an auger, a compost spreader, a harvester, and more attachments. If you like to know more, please jump on their website at curlyzag.com and feel free to contact them for more information. Curly Zag are distributing in the US and soon opening up in Europe. G'day and welcome back to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast. On the show this week, we have a great conversation with Wayne Shields of Peninsula Fresh Organics. Wayne runs a large-scale organic vegetable farm and we dive into a number of topics ranging from developing and growing a farming business, quality control and effectively managing crops, selling to supermarkets and wholesalers and much, much more. But before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Boonarung people, traditional custodians of the land on which we talk today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening in today. All right, I'd like to welcome Wayne Shields of Peninsula Fresh Organics to the podcast. Thanks for joining us today, mate. No worries, Mikey. Good to be here. I'd love to um, give some shape to our chat by opening up with a little bit about your farm, its size, its location, and a bit about the context. Yeah, well, we're on the Mornington Peninsula just south of Melbourne. That's that's the main base of our farm, which is uh, Peninsula Fresh Organics. Um, we started, my wife and I, we weren't married at the time, but my wife uh, sort of uh, thought it would be a good idea. My, my father had, used to have a market garden, and I was a market garden a conventional market gardener back in the day when I, I did a did a um, market gardening apprenticeship in the late 80s and early 90s, which um, looking back now was probably a good platform for me to have my own farm. It was also a good platform to be underpaid, but um, I won't go into that. Uh, so I, I, I worked for a lot of, uh, of the big conventional guys on the Mornington Peninsula and got sent away to uh, manage farms up on the Murray River and eventually, you know, you take on your own farm. So I got to 30 and I started my own business um, as a conventional farmer and that was going really well because I worked really hard and, and all of that business. But, you know, I, I um, went into a big uh, um, sort of a share farming and agreement when the drought came in the mid-2000s and um, went into a share farming agreement with some big guys up in Hillston and um, that didn't work out too well when I bought some chemical and sprayed my crops and they all died. Uh, at the time I didn't realise but the um, 
the, the grass spray that I'd bought had a um, chemical in it, a broadleaf chemical in it. And that's where I learned that you're, uh, the chemicals you buy, you might have buy it with a label on it that says it's this, but it uh, doesn't necessarily have that in it. So I was basically bankrupted at the age of 33, which was pretty hard to take. So I sort of wandered around the wilderness of life for, you know, three or four years and just worked for people. Um, and then I met my wife, Natasha, um, in the late 2000s, and um, she settled me down and uh, we moved back to my parents' place, close to my parents' place, and Dad had a five-acre block, and um, he had a couple of acres down the back, which used to be Marker Garden, so I started um, farming that organically in 2009, and... Um, which was a bit of a slow start. I was working for another market gardener at the time, a conventional guy, so it was just part-time stuff. So I'd work, work this 40-hour job or 50-hour job and then come home at night and grow veggies. And um, my wife sort of said, well, we've got to find somewhere to sell this stuff. So she goes, let's get in a farmer's market. And, oh, that just made my blood sort of turn cold because the last thing I ever wanted to do was deal with people. I always wanted to be that farmer that sort of um, stays on the farm and does his own thing. And um, I wasn't I wasn't a great people person. Well, I didn't think I was anyway. So um, she uh, taught me into doing this this farmers market up in Manawatting, which is up up in Melbourne somewhere. So we turned up there and it was pouring with rain. We had half a ute load of veggies and set our tents up in the middle in this horribly wet day and of all the years we've done market mar farmers markets that very first market was still the wettest day we've ever had but we sold all of our produce and everyone seemed to love our produce and we were saying we were organic and and whatnot and they bought right into that and it was it was really interesting and i had uh, four or five hundred dollars put in my pocket for like half a day's work as far as i was concerned and i said well that was great so, you know, I come home with all these bright ideas and and uh, we started planting more and diversifying more and I was thinking, well, you know, uh, if I can sell this stuff retail, which I was at farmer's markets, it, it, it really pays. So, you know, I just worked harder and harder and eventually I worked out of, um, worked out of my old job and cut them down to four days and three days and I just didn't go back at all. I um, got that two and a half acres pumping and I was just doing four or five farmers markets every weekend. Um, my wife started doing them and I'd do another one and, and it just grew from there. Um, so um, farmers markets were a really good thing for me to get me going. Um, luckily on, on the Mornington Peninsula which has got a lot of you know, land bank land, which is basically, it's, it's in a green wedge, which is a government overlay for land use, which uh, everybody buys land around here thinking it's going to go for housing. But if you've got this green wedge overlay, well, it makes it a lot harder to go and doesn't stop people buying it, thinking they can change the government's mind. But in, in the meantime, there's a lot of vacant land that's available for renting. So I've just con consistently... Uh, rented more land, so I've gone from that two and a half acre block now in Baxter on the, on the peninsula. We've we've got 45 acres here going full time, and that still wasn't enough for, for the growth and the opportunity that was there for an organic grower. So I um, found some, found my old paddock was available to buy up in um, Barham on the New South Wales um, border, so there's 100 acres up there, and I, I got that at the right price, and sort of went all in farming then. And ever since then, I've I've been uh, madly chewing because I, I, I bit off more than I can chew, so I'm you know, sort of chewing like mad. <laughs> That's probably the the best way to put how things have evolved. But yeah, so there's a we've got a 100 acre farm up at Barham in the New South Wales Murray River and a 45-acre operation down here on the Mornington Peninsula. Yeah, that's quite, a, that's quite a size, and that's quite a size jump, as you said, starting from two and a half acres. I'm, I'm, really, um, I'm really fascinated to kind of to dive into that and explore your journey as a farmer from 
farming on two and a half acres, like you said, and selling a number of farmers market that kind of, I'm assuming the intensity of, of production on that scale. And then realizing, as you've mentioned, that the demand was so high that you've just consistently been growing. And I need to know, you know, yeah, there plans to even grow further. Oh, we're, we're probably about halfway, <laughs> the way I see it. Um, there's still a lot of demand there. Um, demand's changing. We're, where I'm finding the growth isn't where I found it at the start, um, which is a good thing, you know. Things evolve and there's no point a big bloke like me sort of dominating the farmer's market scene. I'm, I'm all very I'm very keen for everyone to sort of push me out of that market. If you, in, in, in some ways, I love doing the markets, but, you know, there's an evolution there, you know. You should sort of creep up the ladder to a degree or you sort of can regress into them. Um, the way I see farmers' markets. Um, but, you know, you've got to go where the sales are. And um, so where are the sales, where the shelves are, and who's got all the shelves? So you, I've sort of moved into the supermarkets and they're a big part, they're a big part of my business now. Um, and they're happy to have me and, and, and they've been pretty good to deal with actually at the moment. Um, see how it, see if that changes when there's a bit more competition around. But at the moment, I'm... I'm one of the few guys in town that are supplying the supermarket, so it's sort of working well. Well, as you said, I think you've mentioned yourself as kind of a usual trajectory in which as as a vegetable business business scales, um, its sales and distribution grows alongside it, which is obviously happening with you as you're diversifying and moving into the supermarket and um, organic grocery stores. But I think there is there is a real uniqueness about your operation as it currently stands because you are at a very large scale in comparison to a lot of the growers that attend farmers markets and farmers that we have on the show. Um, but as it currently stands, you still sell at a number of farmers markets weekly, you know, four seasons long, um, as well as having a farm gate and a retail shop. That's right. Could you, yeah, could you share a little bit about um, about selling at farmers markets and the reasons why you're still there? Uh well, they work for us. Uh, we've got a really good client base. The um, the market managers still want us because uh, we're probably a bit more consistent um, having produce because uh, having the two sites has really worked for me. Um, I can have year-round production. Um, at the end of the day, I'll, I've been market gardening probably for 35 years now one way or another working for blokes and by myself and working with dad. So I sort of know how to keep a consistent product and that's really key to having um, good relationships with your customers. So um, I've been basically asked to stay in the farmers markets and, you know, I, I love going to markets where there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of other veggie farmers because I find they're the best ones. Um, I spent a lot of time behind the scenes on the, with the Victorian Farmers Market Association. Um, I ended up being president of that for about four years um, because I believed in this. I believed in farmers markets. I believed in what they did. I, I believed how, that they were good for everyone. And um, so, so that's probably why I'm still there. They've, they've sort of what birthed me in a way. So there's that. Um, there's that feel that, you know, I belong there still um, and I'm, I'm actually an, an important part for a lot of the, the um, markets to be consistent across the, the down times, um, which is sort of nice nice to hear because there's, there's probably not a lot of us that um, produce year-round. There's me and there's about two or three others that have got a, a good consistent offering, but a lot of the small guys just don't have the capacity to go year-round yet. I suppose that's what that's about. Yeah, I think that's something which I really noticed seeing. You, you have a, an, an incredible um, diverse array of vegetables that you bring to the market. And that, that is something which has always been, I think, sometimes a bit of the weak point of farmers markets. Once a lot of farmers um, gear their operations towards the peak of summer, um, you, a lot of people look at that as the, uh, the peak of the season um, and winter being an off-season where production is a little bit harder Um space is a little bit more difficult with some of the larger winter grown crops but I've always noticed obviously because of the scale of your operation that the consumers really appreciate having you there because week in week out you have an incredible store which is you know there's piles of broccolis and leeks cauliflowers um, which 
which is something which I think is a real draw card to pulling in, making sure that customers know that there's always going to be um, a supply of good quality crops at the farmer's markets if another stall doesn't have that item. That's right. And that's why I say a good farmer's market's got several veggie growers there. Like a, when, particularly when I was at the VFMO, I used to hear the, a lot of people complain, saying, oh, there's too many veggie growers, too many veggie growers. But all of the best bit, all the best markets I ever attended, I was just one of a number of veggie growers. So and you, the, the whole concept of a farmer's market is to actually draw in produce, a broad range of produce, and in a way to mirror a supermarket in, in certain ways. It just, um, there were used to be a few markets run around Melbourne years ago that used to look after only one or two veggie growers, and that was all that could ever get in there. Well, those markets never survived because it just wasn't the draw card um, for people to come in. So you've got to, got to have a pretty broad um, consistency and be a little bit eclectic to, um, to survive as a farmer's market. It was all pretty turbulent 10, 15 years ago, but it, it settled down into a nice groove now. But and I'm, and I'm still part of that, which I, I sort of like that. What were some of the main takeaways that you've you've obviously been at the farmers market for a long time now? And I'm really always interested in exploring with veteran growers like yourself some of the the key lessons and takeaways that you've mentioned a few, making sure you've got consistency of product across you know across the year and season as well. Could you could you share with us a few of those those insights that you've taken throughout the years? Sure. Like, um, it's tough being a veggie grower because the easy time to grow veggies is in sort of spring, late spring and summer, and you get these wonderful flushes of vegetables. Everything's coming on quickly and it looks fantastic. But the general public are basically sick of eating vegetables all winter. And uh, you've got these lovely things called nectarines and peaches and strawberries that all come in in late spring. And <laughs> so when a veggie grower's um, got his best crops, we're not, we're not the flavour of the month. You know, the consumer comes in with a certain amount of dollars they spend and um, the, uh, the veggie budget gets exchanged for the fruit budget when the, when the good fruits are in. So that, that's always a bit of a heartbreaker. So we always made our money at on the farmers markets during the winter. So we really geared our production around winter. Um, we would fill our paddocks up in you know, March, April, May, just busting, just to know that we could carry our, carry our production right through, you know, June, July, August, even early September. Um, so that was a really important thing for a veggie grower to do. Yeah. And in terms of scale, like I know, Winter growing, as I was saying before, demands actually quite a bit more land, which I think is sometimes a challenge for the smaller operations, which are only functioning off an acre or two. Um, is that something that you've you've found as well, that once you decided to be really focus on your winter growing for farmers' markets, there was a certain land size that you needed to have in order to, to accommodate that? Well, I've always worked with what I've got to the best of my ability. And, you know, um, once I took on, I think I was 2013, I bought the property up in Barham. That that basically gave me 100 acres up my sleeve and that was good winter production area. It was it's a, a good Mediterranean climate up, up there, quite dry, dry winters. Um, it's always dry. Even when it's raining, it's dry. It's um, big frosts. Um, and a lot of land, so I, I, I built into that paddock. So I always just always had the scope there to um, have enough stuff for winter once I got that paddock. But I was I was finding it harder earlier on when I was only on ten or fifteen acres, just to have a lot of stuff in the late winter. Yeah, your 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 barum your barum site that you've been speaking about is something which I, I wrote a few questions down because I'm. I'm fascinated about it, about having a split property site in terms of, you know, the dual context of your, your farming in one being a kind of a, a warm or cool temperate, one being a Mediterranean. I'm sure there's different soil types across them. And I always remember I was not far growing from you. I was about 30 minutes up the road from you. And I was growing some beautiful carrots over the, over the summer period, spring, summer, autumn. And once the winter set in and my, my heavier clay soils got saturated and cold, I... I really began struggling to grow 
to grow certain crops, particularly carrots. Remember, I grow some beautiful carrots, but over the winter and I, over a number of years, I, I trialed different things until I kind of came to the conclusion that there are some farm contexts and soil types and weather that just doesn't suit certain crops at certain times of the year. And maybe it's not worth trying to push that too far. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering when you split your property and um, started farming across the two sites, were there specific crops that you exclusively grew up in the northern site as opposed to the southern site? Um, and what was the influence of those two different contexts on your business? Yeah, there's, they're, they're two different sites. They're similar and they're different. Um, but what the two sites gave me was year-round production on certain things. Um, carrots, there's, there's one answer. Like, I've just finished my carrots down here at the peninsula now, and my carrots are starting up at Barham now, um, just because... Um, yeah, it's really hard to overwinter carrots. You know, if you get a wet year like we're having now, the ends rot. Um, they get stumpy. They they're gnarly. It's just not nice. But whereas up at Barham, you'll grow a good good a good carrot. But uh, lettuce is something of is probably one of my main lines now, and it's something that the wholesale markets and the um, supermarkets are quite interested in. So uh, the that's a really interesting way I do things. So I'll spend, I, I grow seven months, lettuce for seven months down south on the peninsula. And then the other five months, that'll go up, up north onto the Murray River. And it's about 350 kilometres north from here. But I'll grow a really good year. I'll have a really good year round, um, you know, lettuce selection. Um, they'll all be market quality, which is, you know, when you start dealing with the supermarket, you, you've got to hit certain guidelines. You've got to, you've got to hit their specs. Um, so I can grow a lettuce year-round, having the two sites. Uh, leeks is another thing. I, I moved my leek production off the peninsula and put it all up on the Murray just because that was a long-term crop and um, land was cheap up there, whereas... It was really, it was really tough for me to have my leeks down here. They grew fine, they grew really well, but they held up a lot of good ground. Like my peninsula ground's my best ground, but I can grow a good leek up at Barham anyway. But um, nothing worse than having, I grow half a million leeks a year now. Um, that takes up a lot of land, and I'd rather grow three or four crops of lettuce and Asian greens and carrots and radish and kale down here in the summer than, than um, have a, a crop of leeks down here. So that's given me a bit of um, flexibility in the, getting um, a good ground into peak production. Um, and the other, the other good thing about having the two sites was water availability. Uh, obviously on the Mornington Peninsula it's generally wet, but every now and then you'll get a dry year and we just don't have access to an irrigation scheme here. So when you run out of water, you run out of water. Um, whereas up on the Murray River, I can always buy it because it's on an irrigation system. And it, the, the price varies and it got very expensive a couple of years ago. But I can always outbid a, a dairy farmer who wants to grow a bit of grass. So there's always a capacity to make an economic decision on what you do, um, having that other property up there because it's got access to irrigation water. Throughout this conversation, I really want to draw into your experience as being a large-scale grower and, and pull it back to being um, what small-scale growers can learn. And like I was hinting at before, I think a number of times, and there's a lot of us growers out there who really push and innovate and get you know we get challenged and we fail at certain crops, um, and sometimes believing, you know, it's it's our skill set, which is, you know, just not up to scratch. But it's it's interesting reflecting upon some of the stuff you're sharing, which are, essentially highlights that how much the climate and context really play a huge role um, in some crops, specifically when you're trying to grow them as a year round. Growing them in one season, you can get a, a fantastic result. And, um, you know, due to, due to rainfall and soil type in another season, it can be very difficult to grow that. That's exactly right. I've got all the spreadsheets because I keep a lot of data on what I do. And spring onions is another one of my, my main crops. And I, um, I've got a cut-off date when I stop planting on the Mornington Peninsula because 
every day I plant past that certain date on the Mornington Peninsula, the, the percentage of that crop failing every day after that, the risk uh, just accelerates. So um, if I have more, if I have spring onions ready on the 1st of April, um, they might be good or they might be buggered. Um, but I know one thing, if I have them at the 1st of May, they're not going to be any good at all. So sometimes there's that fine line between the 1st of April and the 1st of May that you might or you might not have spring onions that don't get attacked by downy mildew. But any time before the 1st of April, I will have good spring onions. I know that because that's something I've learned over time. And I, that, that one month there in April, well, I don't bother to I don't bother to fight it because you just don't know. So I'll make sure all my spring onions are, are planted up at Barham on the 1st of February to be ready on the 1st of April because what's the point in taking that risk? So you learn these things. You, you can't fight Mother Nature. When she wants to do something, she's going to do it. And when you're an organic grower, your toolbox isn't as... Um, the tools you've got to combat, you know, diseases is, isn't as good as a conventional guy. Um, so why, why fight nature and just work with it? Is that risk management you're talking about, is that something that you develop the mindset for and understanding for as your farm grew? Or in the early years, did you also go through a period of really trying to push push the limits of what seasonal growing could be or what the context of your farm site was asking for? Yeah, I, I tend to learn the hard way with everything. So um, just because one year I, I grew my spring onions till May and then I thought I was right, so I kept growing them down there and I thought I was right and I promised people this. And then the next year was a different type of year, you know, it was a little bit cooler, a little bit more moist, moisture in the air and, and I lost all my uh, spring onions from the first week of April. So, yeah, um, you don't know what you don't know, so you just got to, keep testing things and just learn learn what you can do. But, um, you know, there's literature out there about stuff, but it, it's never applicable to what you're doing exactly. So you, you've just got to think generally about things and look around at what other people are doing. You know, you don't look at what the conventional guys are doing if you're an organic guy. If they're starting to struggle with a, with a crop in your area, um, you can be guaranteed that if you're organic, you're not going to get it generally speaking it's a really important insight um because I, I i when you are farming on a on a very small land base you have to be very tactical in terms of what you're growing at certain times because the margins are the margins can be tight um and what you want to bring is something which i think small scale growers pride themselves on is obviously of the highest quality that's what we say due due to having a small scale um it enables us to you know, physically and directly oversee our crops from day to day, um, which brings me to something I've been very interested to ask you about in terms of when you scaled up from being, you know, 2.5 to 10 to 40 and, and onwards, I'm, I'm fascinated to explore the topic of, of quality and quality control when applied to large volumes of production. And I think even more uniquely in your case, it's, it's large volumes of production across a wide selection of crops and varieties could you talk us through a bit about how quality is maintained on such a scale yeah uh, simplistically saying it, i've got better and that's probably because i've got smarter and i've learned a lot of hard lessons so i'm better at doing what i what i was doing which has worked out that my systems and procedures uh, have been standardised to achieve a good result. That's a very um, sterile, sterile way of putting it, but I'm, I'm better at being consistent and good now than I was, and whether that's because I've learnt these things or scales helped me do that. In a way, scale has helped me do that. Um, but from day one, when I went to the farmers markets, you know, you'd look around at your competition and you go and say good day, and you look at their stock and all of that. And, and from my history as a conventional market gardener, I knew how to do things well, and I knew the presentation was important. So generally speaking, I, I always made the, the I always made the attempt to have the best uh, produce in the market, and that hasn't changed. 
Um, I've just got better at maintaining it. I've, I've, I understand the varieties I use now and the timings of those varieties which help these things. I've got good fertiliser programs and I've standardised my equipment to achieve those results. So um, things have sort of become, it's a, systems and procedures have kicked in and, and give me a pretty good result on things. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm in really good farming weather. Um, I, so that helps me a lot. But why fight nature? So you've only got to grow what works for you. And it easier to be, be more consistent and better the bigger I've got. Yeah, and I'd be interested to dive deeper into that um, and, and hear you speak a little bit more about it because I think, you know, it, it, it might sound a bit stale, but for a lot of, a lot of growers – you know, topics of standardising and management procedures is something which I think is of the utmost use and benefit for a lot of growers. Um, and I know that you, I was looking over your, your Instagram page and you had a post which you, um, it was basically a, a shot behind the tractor of your Pak Choi field, which was, had been completely picked and you, and you wrote 99% um, harvest. And I was, I was looking at that and I was, it, was, it was remarkable, again, at the scale that you're growing, what are some of the the real hard techniques which you've hinted at, which enable you to get to a point where, you know, you are harvesting 99% of, of specific crops or that's the goal to get to? Yeah, sure. Like, um, not all crops are like that. I, um, I've, I've, got a, I've got a spreadsheet in front of me with my, my, my average yields on, on all of these things. So, you know, I'm aiming around 85% um, on a lot of my crops, some some are down to seventy percent, and they're, they're the marginal crops. But I, I, I hang in there with them and trying to get better. Um, but yeah, I do like those ninety nine percent crops. They're, they're good, gives me a bit of a kick. Um, but it's a bit of a team effort, you know. I I do my part, which is the growing. Um, I, I've I've worked out my growing patterns, my fertilizers, and I've I've built my soil over the years, which has only got better. Um, I refine my techniques about how I, I work my ground. I pay my staff better than most people around here. They're above award wages, so they stay with me. Uh, they've been with me for years and um, they're well trained and they know what to do. So that helps. Um, that helps immensely. That's a big part of the picture. Um, having the so Being the size I am, I can't do everything. I'm capable of doing every job that's on this farm, but I just don't, can't physically do it. Um, I've got 40 odd staff at the moment, so um, I need a lot of help to do what I do. Um, but every one of those staff are trained up and they know what to do themselves. Um, again, that comes back to the systems and procedures we've sort of put in place. And like I said, it hasn't been cheap to do, but we pay people properly and and above ward wage and they get overtime and all of that and then that just keeps them working for me and that keeps um that helps me because those guys are going to plant those asian greens just right the way i like they're going to cut them just right they're not going to be rushed they're not going to bruise them in the paddock they're going to deliver me to the packing shed the product i want um so there's, there's a lot to this it's not just the growing you know at the end of the day on the I'm the fireman around this farm, so I'm, I'm not even. I don't. I don't sell the veggies anymore. I don't grow the veggies anymore, though I do. They they do it to my instructions, but um, I just sort of run around and fix things all over the place. Just keep the show on the road, really, and just cast my eye over things and see the issues and sort of head them off when I can see something's not quite right, but. It's pretty well sorted itself out around here now. We've got good systems and procedures, which is delivering me a good product. Could you share with me a little bit about what you were saying before? You have some crops which are, you know, they're the 99 percenters, and you've got the some which are the 70 percenters. And I'm just interesting to kind of unpack that a little bit and understand what what would make a crop um, a success rate dropping down to a 70 percent. And is that is that something that is innate in that crop in your condition um, or is it something that if you decided to specialise a bit more, there's a possibility of bringing that number up to a, a higher, a higher, you know, higher percentage? Yeah, a bit of all of that. Like um, something that just pays, some, some of the crops will still pay when they're only at 70%. Um, 
and that's probably uh, one of those ones where, you know, it's a little bit slower growing and sometimes the weeds will beat it. Um, it'll be not quite the right variety for to go year round and, and I'll just push it to do it because it's worth it for me because I may well be getting retail prices at that. That might be one of those crops that works really well in the farmer's markets, whereas if it was a wholesale price return like my a lot of my lettuces, I wouldn't do that. Um, so everything you weigh everything up around the business context too. But having the having the farm shops and having the farmers markets, I can get a few retail dollars as well, which is really um, which is really nice and is what really got me going. It gave me enough money uh, income early on in my farming to invest in in tractors and um, more land and and all of these things that got me to where I am now. But if I'm being a hard, you know, um, looking at everything through just the prism of economic rationalism, there'd be there'd be quite. A, I'd cut a lot of crops. Um, fennel's one of them that can be really um, temperamental. Uh, Variety-wise, I haven't nailed down which is the best one um, for year-round production. And there probably isn't one. There's probably one that there's probably about four or five I need to use, and I just haven't spent the time to find that, find what those varieties are. Um, and if it gets a little bit dry, well, they suffer, and sometimes I, I I don't catch that all the time. And then there's the spring flush, and fennel's always something that really likes to go to seed before before a lot of other crops. So that's why those numbers aren't great on fennel. So I like to put, tell things how they are, so I put those numbers into my spreadsheets and it doesn't look real good when it says I only get 70% of the fennel I plant. But, you know, when when it's good, I'll get 100%, but, you know, in spring when things are going to seed and it's coming dry and the wind's blowing, I'll only cut half a patch. So that's just how I do things. In terms of trialling varieties, are you sowing, are you sowing a number of, varieties of fennel at the same time and kind of uh, following them throughout the seasons to understand which ones are producing more consistent bulb sizes, which ones are flowering earlier, which ones had better flavour. Um, and do you also have a fallback variety that you use for your main, the main bulk of your, of your production of that variety per se? Yeah, I've got a, I've got my standard variety, which generally runs year round, but I I sort of flirt with a few other varieties just to trial them here and there. And um, I did swap at one point, you know, I was getting really good results. And then the next year, the results were nothing the same. So I backed away from that variety because I couldn't get the consistency I wanted in it. Um, so I'm always just sort of trialling, but I, I haven't got the time and the inclination actually to it to get four or five trays of varieties going at once because it, it's such a small crop for me nowadays it, it's not one of my you know blue ribbon crops anymore it's just it's nice to have for the farm shop and it's nice to have um for the farmers markets but that's where that crop's going to live for me i'm gonna my my main main crops I'll, I'll spend my time on the asian greens the lettuces and the leeks and and the, the shards and the, all of that sort of business are those your are those your blue ribbon crops? Those that list you just shared? Yep, yep, that and you probably add radish and, and my coloured carrots to that. So they're the ones that the supermarkets are interested in. They're the ones that the wholesale markets are interested in, and um, and and they do really well at the farmers markets too. But um, those other smaller crops like the you know we do chicory and and endive and beetroot a bit, um, which early days they were big crops for me. But you know. Things evolve. You sort of you take the the path of least resistance, and uh, that's how I've ended up with the lettuce and the, and the Asian greens. And, and funnily enough, all the conventional guys around here grow those same crops. So yeah, just we're in the right right sort of region to do those things. Hey, you all just jumping in real quick to give a shout out to our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no till growers. This site is the lifeblood of our work and we appreciate so much the support. It makes things like this small series possible and just generally enables us to keep our work free and open to anyone and everyone. 
we can pay our creators for their work and then keep giving that work away for free. If that's something you believe in, please consider pitching in a few bucks at patreon.com slash no till growers. Also, there are some perks there like first dibs and discounts on merch, books, events we do in the future and at a certain level. Or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Stephanie and Alex from Blue Berwyn Farm, Alberto Diaz, Ojai Roots, Scott Harris, Earth Care Farmer Jane Murner Cynical, Asia Smith, Scott Snodgrass, Andrew and Haley from Avoda Sustainable Acres, Jay Mill, Tony Lopez, Thomas Eliason, Judson Taylor, John Mills, Grown Up Farm, Jacob Arthur, Clara Coleman, Wild Mountain Seeds, Jared Kirst, Jay Armour, Dan Breezebois, C. Max Small, Jay McCombs, Tim Baldwin, Mark Andre Giroux, Esoterra Culinary, Steve Larson, Jean Martin Fortier, Yannick Laplante, and Jen Lawrence. Huge thanks to all of our show supporters. All right, back to Mikey. In order for me to get a little bit more of a grasp, and I, I say this because as a small scale grower, it, it's always a bit mind mind baffling hearing some of the numbers and the scales that farmers like yourself grow at. Like you dropped before half a million leeks. Um, what what for some of those blue ribbon crops? What does what does yearly production look like, or what does even what does a, a peak a peak succession look like for a for a crop of those? We've never really grown too many of these things. So, you know, the Asian greens, we, I think we planted, we, we plant them all by transplant just because it helps control the weeds and they're a lot more consistent. Um, so, you know, we buy 2 million Asian green plants every year. You know, I expect that'll be 3 million next year just because it just keeps growing. Um, lettuces, I think I've, I think I've off the top of my head, I'll take a guess. That'll be close to two million this year. Two million lettuces um, of various descriptions. Uh, cauliflowers, I think we planted two hundred thousand this year. Um, leeks, like I said, half a million. That'll probably go up. Um, yeah, they're all up. It's quite be quite significant, but. Um, you need that sort of scale for, for what I'm doing now. I, I keep running out, keep running out. I've got no Asian greens to sell this week. So that's embarrassing. Um, you try to be consistent. Consistency is key to have these when you're in the wholesale markets. Um, so I've just got to keep keep growing and keep getting better at what I do. You've made mention that consistently over the years of growing demand has not diminished it keeps it keeps getting larger and larger and on, and on that note i'm interested to hear your thoughts on on that on the organic industry and, and its growth and the consumer wanting more and more and how maybe how small scale growers can can get a larger piece of the pie um in that and also sharing your trajectory how you have answered that that demand um, in terms of your business, you've hinted at it before that you're moving into more of the wholesale and the farmers, uh, sorry, wholesale and supermarkets. Is that is that the general demand? There seems to be more and more demand for organic food in supermarkets, and that's where the that's where it's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. The demand for of out of the, the well, the talk and the rhetoric from the supermarkets is they want organic produce. Um, I think Woolworths have got an organic fund, so they're they're offering people money to they're offering conventional growers. Um, you know, interest-free loans to um, convert to organic. You know, that sounds good. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I really like the, the idea of a, a smaller organic producer growing and filling the void rather than the conventional guys pivoting and, you know, pivoting into our neck of the woods. That, that worries me a little bit. Um, I think it's all right. I'm not against it, but I'd much rather the small growers sort of have a go at filling the void. So I've had a, you know, a few people have had a bit of a chip at me over the years about supplying the supermarkets, you know, a few of the small growers say, oh, you know, you're doing the wrong thing and da-da-da. And I'm, I don't really think so. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm just, every every time I sell a lettuce or a, an Asian green or a leek on a supermarket shelf, well, that that's, that's displacing a conventional sale. So I think that's pretty good. Um, 
and I, and I really like the idea of you know these smaller growers doing that. Um, there's a few of us doing it. There's three or four of us that are doing it that have come from a small scale organic production that are now on the supermarket shelves. Um, that that's how I'd like to see it it grow. Um, it, but at the end of the day, I mean, there's only so many farmers markets around, and a lot the vast majority of people don't shop at farmers markets, unfortunately. Um, so I always like the idea if if you can put a good product in front of the general consumer, not a farmers market consumer, and it, and you can get that sale, or if you can, can convince them to buy organic or they just see it and they want it because it looks better or looks good, well, that, that's a win for everyone. That's a win for the consumer. That's a win for the, the organic farmer over the conventional model in my book. So, that, so the, the, path of, the path of supply at this stage in your eyes is, is the growth of some small-scale farms to fill that niche in terms of selling and providing more of the supermarket shelf, which is what you're consistently saying, that the demand for the consumer is there there's only a certain amount of space at the farmers markets. Um, what what is the path in your eyes for a small operation growing their operation and and finding those sales and connections in grocery stores and supermarkets? Yeah, um, for me it was, and this is probably the best way to do it. I, I I'd recommend you, you you start at farmers markets. So I think they're the best way to go. You get some interaction, you get feedback. Um, but then you you got to start dealing with a whole different world. You've got to deal with the um, wholesalers. So probably the in the central markets, like Melbourne has a central market with with three or four organic wholesalers in there. Uh, Sydney has a central market with two or three organic wholesalers. Uh, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Adelaide, all the all the cities have um, organic wholesalers. So you best you it would be always worth going to talk to those guys. They're always looking for produce. They'll give you a go. You might not like the prices when, you, <laughs> when you're used to farmer's market retail prices, but um, that, that's the path of uh, growth. Um, at least you can sell volume, and that's where you start building efficiencies in your businesses, when you can start selling volume and, volume and stuff. Instead of planting a, 100 beetroot plants a, a week, you plant 1,000. You might have to hire someone to do it, but, you know, um, you start... You start doing it that way, and it, you, you're building. You can build quite quickly. Um, if you if you've got good produce, um, that's the way to do it. Um, once you've dealt with the the wholesale market for a while, um, and you start approaching, knocking on the door of the supermarkets, and that's not easy. I mean, it's taken me a long time to to get my foot in the door there, and I've done that via consolidators and then you know direct direct uh, approaches and. Some are, some are easier to deal with than others, but um, at the end of the day, if you can fit their, their procedures, they'll, they'll happily take your product. And they're, they're not as bad to deal with as everyone says. Well, at least in the organic side of things anyway, but I, I suspect the uh, supply and demand equation's in my favour at the moment. It seems like that the, farm, the supermarkets obviously meet a con- the, the, con- the current consumer pattern for purchasing, where we've all been accustomed to going um, into a supermarket and finding produce almost 24-7, depending on, on where, where you are. You recently, you actually opened up, if I'm not mistaken, a, a farm store. You have your farm gate on site, but you've also opened up a, a farm store. Do you, Is there a place for small-scale growers who are wanting to scale up or are wanting to meet the consumer demand of potentially collaborating together, sharing a grocery storefront and selling their produce that way? Absolutely, but uh, I, don't, I don't know how to work, but um, there's, uh, there's a few uh, aggregators doing it, but at least they're um, buying a bit of produce off um, a lot of local guys. Like the, near me, we have a place called the Ball Ball Food Hub. That's been really successful um i don't know that we all own it which is probably a good thing but um you sort of feel part of it because you you've been there from the start and um, you're a consistent um supplier and they're consistent buyers so that that's direct relationships with a few a few of these sort of stores and and they're in it um as a um 
as a community group. So that that's one way that's sort of been interesting and 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 has worked. Um, there's been a lot of government funding in thrown at other other versions of that, but really that they were just um, how do you say it um, without offending anyone? They were just reinventing the wheel. <laughs> um, might have kept it, some people in a job for a while, but at the end of the day, all they did was reinvent what's already out there in private in, uh, private enterprise. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, it's we we had our farm shot. Our farm gates are really good, a good way to get get going. And, uh, you know, you got to work within the rules with those things because there's been a bit of few issues around down here, but that that's all sort of settled down now. But um, retail retail is an interesting thing if you're going to do it yourself or we've done it, it's okay. Um, but the supermarkets for me have, have got the shelf space and they're, they're willing to put our stock on it. So that's good. Um, I, I just like the idea of getting my produce in front of people because then it sorts itself out. It gets sold then. How, how you work with things, I, I like the farmers markets for working in with everyone else. I think that's the best way. But beyond that, the next step to me is um, wholesale and, box schemes and all of that. It all depends how far you want to take it. Moving into the the retail space, the grocery stores, supermarkets and the likes, um, there seems to be also a correlation with, with, with packaging. And I know a lot of small-scale growers who rely on microgreens, salad mixes and the likes um, in order to maintain high quality and also ease of sale, you utilise packaging, labelled packaging, which obviously looks after the quality but also presents their product in a really, really fine manner and also gives their, their farm some great um, publicity. Recently, yourself, Natasha, well, Natasha had a, a Nuffield Scholar, your partner had a Nuffield Scholarship where she travelled and was researching and exploring alternative packaging for the vegetable industry. And I'm very interested to hear how that has gone, what what insights have you found in terms of packaging um, and specifically what, what does it mean for a grower to have their to have their product labelled with their farm name on it on a shelf? Well, well I'll start with the Nuffield Scholarship and my wife, Natasha. Um, so she was lucky to get a 2019 scholarship, which was the last year you could travel. <laughs> um, so she, she got her travel in and, and learned a lot about what's going on in recycled packaging and uh, compostable packaging and all of that. Um, and there's a lot of really good products out there. Um, so she came to that conclusion that we, um, that was her Nuffield, um, that was her topic because being organic, you know, we, we naturally have people that are contrarians that gravitate, um, and, you know, they, they care for the environment they don't want the chemicals out there. And then the next worst thing would be the plastic packaging. So, um, we want to address that because we used to get a lot of um, feedback from customers. Oh, why do you put put lettuce in a plastic bag? You shouldn't do that. And you know, we know that it keeps about ten times longer if you do. Um, but some people are just philosophically against it, and that's fine. Um, so we just thought, well, what's the answer to that? So we thought about uh, compostable packaging or recyclable pack. Packaging was sort of the way to go and organics have really got to sort of lead that charge. So she went out and did that and travelled the world. And there, there is an answer out there. Uh, there's lots of answers out there. But um, when you come back home to Australia and you you want to talk to the, um, the real, you know, the, your local council about it and your, your retailers about it and, um, you know, one retailer's keen for it and the next retailer's not keen for it, your wholesaler's half interested and then they're very interested and then and they decide they decide they want recycled packaging whereas the other retailer you're dealing with wants compostable packaging uh so then we worked out there's actually the, the answers are there but um nobody's settled on what they want so we're sort of stuck between two places at the moment on on what we're going to do but as an industry, I think we've got to wait for the rest of the um, the rest of the uh, country. The government's probably got to mandate what we do, 
and main, mandate that back into the retailers, what has to happen, and then we can probably move forward from there. But at the moment, it's the answers are out there, but there, there, there's um, nobody knows which one to go, what horse to back. So that's what it looks like out there. Um, as for your branding, branding is really important. Um, I love nothing better than getting photos of my produce looking really good from people in Mariba who have just bought it and says, this is fantastic. We didn't think we could get this produce up here. Um, Mariba's only three and three or 4,000 kilometres away. No small distance. It's a long way. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, you go into the supermarkets. It's That's always good because I... <laughs> Every time me and my wife go away, you know, we, the first place we go is go to the supermarket and have a look what's on Coles or Woolworth shelves and um, try and find our product because sometimes it's got our label on it and, and we think it looks fantastic with our label. Um, you, you know, you walk a bit taller and you make sure it looks right on the shelf and you, it's pretty happy. And then sometimes we have to label under under the supermarket's uh, generic label, which is a bit disappointing, but it still looks all right. And, you know, there's a little code on that label. You can tell if it's yours or not. So um, I'd rather sell under my own label because I think I do a good job and I'm pretty proud of what I do. So um, it gives you a kick. And uh, you certainly do get a lot of phone calls from um, all over the place. with People, when they see it, they want it. How do we get it? Um, so... Brandings and packaging is pretty important. Um, as for using the, the, the generic stuff, well, it doesn't float my boat so much. It costs just as much and you don't get the recognition. Have you partaken in, you know, in, in partnering with supermarkets and grocery stores? Do you undertake some education with those retailers to make sure that once that produce leaves your hands that it's it's held up to a certain quality, specifically having it labelled under your name. There's nothing worse than selling to a place and, like you said, you walk in, you check out the produce and it's it's at a substandard to what you'd obviously sold to them, making sure that you've managed that quality from the very beginning to the end. It can be quite disheartening, I can imagine, walking in and seeing something that hasn't been held as well. Yeah, well, um, the, the packaging tends to address that. Um, that's the nature of it. Um, and I suspect that's why it's been, to a degree, it's been forced on us. Um, because uh, we'll, we'll take supermarkets for example. They, they don't, you know, they've got young kids who aren't probably that well trained in stocking shelves um, in the green, the in the um, grocer department. So, um, but if it goes in a plastic bag, it, it just tends to look after itself. As long as it's cool, it'll be right. So it's sort of where that that's sort of how the the packaging's come into its own in a way it's it's made the uh the life of the you know, shop attendant in the supermarkets that much easier um so we don't have to have those conversations that that's another another thing that's wrong with the wholesale market in a way is a, a lot of the organic um wholesale uh, retailers are probably more interested in doing dry goods and fresh produce because You've got to work your fresh produce um, um, display, whereas if you buy a, tan, a tin of organic beans, it can sit on the shelf for three months and you don't have to touch it. Whereas if it's a if it's a lettuce without any packaging, because the wholesale is more in, inclined to um, not have packaging on it because their, their customers are a little bit more um, into the, the, the no packaging thing, all those guys buy a lettuce and they put it on the shelf and then, again, they don't work the shop, the shelves properly, they don't keep it moist, they don't keep it cool enough. Some do, a lot don't though, and the produce doesn't really look that good. So that that's why I've sort of moved to the, the supermarkets a little bit because it, at least the product lasts longer on the supermarket shelves in a lot of cases. Um, so the, um, the retailers... That they're either interested in doing a good job in fresh fruit and vegetables or they're not. So the last thing they want to hear is having someone come up and tell them how, how to do it is what, what we've found, but that's probably half the reason we've opened our own shop so we could do our own, our own produce properly. I'd like to shift the, um, the conversation towards dealing with fertility management and, and soil health across your farm sites. 
Um, and I'm very interested to know if you have a fertility plan which is specified and quite honed into the different crops that you're growing or if you have a, a, a full site management plan that goes across your whole farm site. No, my fertiliser is crop specific, uh, more, site, more so than site specific. It, it does change um, naturally around the Mornish Peninsula. We're a little bit light on with manganese. Um, so we, we bolster a bit of manganese sulfate into a bit of stuff occasionally. Whereas um, up at Barham, um, molybdenum and zinc is probably the only place we get a bit of a um, deficiency up there. Um, so we just add that into our compost teas and, or our fertiliser. Um, and that's the only real difference between the two sites. Everything else is more crop specific. So the quicker crops get sort of a base compost and that, that's it. Uh, whereas you know the cauliflowers and the leeks, those longer crops, um, and at you know time of year as well, they'll they'll get top dressed as well, which is just another dose of compost up up the guts or underneath them when they're half grown. Are you managing overall soil health? Are you utilising cover crops in your system, and are you sending off regular um, soil tests and and monitoring essentially? And monitoring the soil through um through those means. I haven't done a lot of soil testing lately. I got a bit disheartened over that. I once did a soil test independently of anyone, and, and I looked at it and went, okay, that's interesting. I then handed that to uh, two different agronomists that it used to come and see me a bit, <laughs> and I got a completely different answer from each of them on what I should do, which is really interesting. And then I just went about what I was, what I thought I should do with it. And, and I've turns out I've been right and they were wrong. Uh, so I don't do a lot of soil testing. I know, I know what's doing. All I'm adding is uh, you know, carbon with a bit of nitrogen in it um, and just keep cycling it. I, I grow a lot of cover crops. I don't like to have my ground bare. Um, the less it's bare, the better. Um, I, I get my crops in and out as quickly as I can. Uh, if I, if the only thing that holds me up really is uh, muddy weather. Otherwise, crops are replanted straight away or there's a cover crop goes in. Um, Barren, we do a lot more cover crops than Baxter. A, that's an economical thing. And B, or, I'm always using the Baxter produce pr uh, product, Baxter paddock to produce the product. Um, up at Barham's a lot sandier. It's a lot hotter, so we don't fill up the, the paddock in summer so we'll um after the winter production i'll start growing hemp uh, sun hemp and um, sorghum and dolichos or lab lab depending what you want to call it um just to get a really big bulk into that because that, that stuff's really fast growing and really bulky you get a bit of nitrogen out of the sun hemp if you if you um you, know, you get a, a nitrogen fixing bacteria to your roots inoculate it I should say. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll get that sorghum up six foot high before I'll incorporate that into the soil and that'll break down really quickly because um, the soil's got a good biology in it now and I can break up um, a lot of um, green matter really quickly now. Uh, winter production, if I'm doing a cover crop up there, I'll be using, you know, vetch. We did a lot of vetch last year, which is good for nitrogen. Um, just oats, a um, little bit of um, tillage radish occasionally. Um, might do a bit of sunflower this year or something different. Um, down south, we'll use basically use um, oats or rye um, in the winter when we've got a bit of bit of spare ground. If it's not too wet to work it up, that that's pretty well it around the cover crops. Just uh, closing up our conversation here. I'm really interested to. Um dart back to the beginning in terms of where you started at, at two and a half acres to where you are currently and just to ask you to reflect upon what what have been some of the the challenges and some of the eases that have accompanied your your farming journey as your farm grew in in scale and and scope oh geez oh well you know droughts are always fun um nothing like running out of water 
yeah, that that's probably been the hardest times, and that really hurts you for quite a while. Um, you know, your crop, you, you've you, you're planting, you still plant because you think it's going to rain the next week, and it just never does. Um, your crops start failing, you know, you, ducks start flying in because you're the last bit of green in the area, and they they think they they take that for themselves. Um, so your production sort of dries right up. And those times are hard. Um, I'm getting better at managing those things now. Um, the ground's improved too. I think it it holds moisture a bit longer. Yeah, look, you just gotta you just gotta know the fundamentals of what 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 makes things grow. Um, water's one of them. Sun, uh, free draining soil. Make sure you've got a bacterial dominant soil if you're going to grow vegetables in my book. Um, I'll get held down for that by some people, but that's the facts. Uh, yeah, you just, and when, when you, as you build, if, if you build a farm of any size, you've you got to learn to manage people and you've got to learn to get good people around you. If you haven't got that, you've got no hope. And I've been really lucky with that. Um, I've got the right people around me. Um, nothing. Nothing makes life harder or farming harder than having to deal with people that are hard to deal with. Um, nobody, I don't mind hard work, but it's hard work dealing with some people if, you, if you're not doing it right or you don't understand it or they're the wrong people. So you just got to know your people that you get around you. Um, that's really important. Um, if you've got a good partner, it makes farming really easy. Um, if you haven't, it's near impossible. What advice would you have for any young, young growers um, in Australia and abroad who are who are wanting to get into farming and wanting to notch up their their growing expertise? What would you suggest would be their best mode of entry into the industry? Go and work for a few blokes. Um, talk to the guys that have probably done what you want to do. Um, talk to them. Work for them. You'll get more out of that than anything. I think it's really unique having having a grower like yourself on the show because, as you know from listening to it, most of the growers are um, are on a much smaller scale. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. Like I mean, it's, it wasn't that long ago for me, so and I really enjoyed my farming back then. <laughs> yeah, you, you find you you really enjoyed it back then. What what you know, as you said, what what do you what do you look back nostalgically? Uh look. Back then, you know, I planted it all myself. I picked it all myself, and it was all—it was all a lot smaller scale. I don't—I don't have the concerns now. If you know what I mean? I've got to, you know, I've got forty staff. I've got to worry about. I've got to make sure that they're, they're fed and all of that. Um, they're paid properly. Um, so it was just different. It, it was good, but you know, it was good and it was nice to think about. But it's something I probably wouldn't have done for too long if I didn't grow. You, you've always just got to, well, I'm, I'm very big on sort of growing, if you know what I mean. There's another challenge, there's another challenge, there's another challenge. Um, so I wouldn't want to just sort of sat sat on five acres for, for 10 or 15 or 20 years. I, I don't think it, you know, that wouldn't have satisfied me. It's good and it's honest and all of that, but, you know, I'm probably the sort of person who needs a challenge, you know. Next year I'll do this and next year I'll do that. Whereas if you just stayed on the five acres where you know what you're going to do next year, the same as you did last year. I was interested to kind of to see, I know you've been listening to the show and you've been following along some of the small farms that are, you know, that are in the area and, and that are growing. There seems to be a lot more small farms growing and I want to know if there's things that you've been learning from the small farming scene that maybe you've been incorporating into your operation as well. Not really, no. I think because I think I've been there and I've done all that. Um, I'm getting, I get some things and I, I hear some things and they really, it really worries me. I'm like, oh, geez, that, no, it, it's probably another way to skin a cat. But I, you know, um, what kind of things specifically? You just hear people talk about these polytunnels, and I mean, I just, nah. Why would you do that? <laughs> polytunnels doesn't excite me. Um, because I, I figure I'd do the maths on the back of an envelope. I mean, you're better off buying ground, you know, 400 kilometres away and it's cheaper and you get more sun and da-da-da and gives you this and gives you that. 
but that's just probably the way I look at it. I, I even had a polytunnel once and I actually gave it away because it just seemed to be inefficient for what I for what I was trying to achieve, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, I think, in Australia listen to those. They're, they're into the polytunnels because I think they listen to the, the American podcasts, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you're saying it's an American podcast, which are in a, a colder a colder climate now, yeah. so the context yeah. fits there. But when you come to Australian climate, we're, we're almost able to grow the majority of those things outdoors almost all year. That's right, yeah. So, you know, that they're getting their information where they can get it from. Sometimes it's sort of not right. And I've spoken to a few small guys and I said, well, what do you do with that one? And they sort of go, no, 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 they know what they're doing. Go, That's all right. They probably do, but... I think we just go around it the hard way. Mm. And in um, terms of, do you, have you grown a lot of this? Some of the the more classic summer crops out out in the field. I know that's probably the one that gets most growers to be utilising tunnels. That's um, you know, eggplants, cucumbers, and, and and tomatoes. Is that something which you do you do think is worthwhile growing indoors, or it just doesn't? Also, it's as cost effective. It doesn't seem to run the numbers. Uh, absolutely, um, those things are great indoors, but you really need a lot of scale. You know what I mean? Um, and I've seen some great stuff. Is um, you know, protected cropping is going to be a big thing in the future. Um, just one or two little tunnels, and I don't know how. You, well, like I said, I, I haven't done it. Pushed it hard enough, but um, you know, cucumbers hanging from trellises are really productive. Tomatoes are really productive. Um, I, I do understand it, but I mean. When you, it's a sort of thing, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not doing it, is um, you really need to um, concentrate on that sort of stuff, do that right, I think. It works for people, though, but it's, it's not my thing. It's probably more my bias about it because I certainly didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I do, I, do, I do hear what you're saying. I do think... They are they are crops that demand I think a lot more attention to detail than other crops, and but I will agree with you that sometimes we can get drawn into the trend in the sense that if you don't like you said run the numbers in the back of an envelope, you can easily be drawn to growing um, tomatoes, you know, and a polytunnel as opposed to field tomatoes. But when you run the numbers of the cost of production in a tunnel, it can actually sometimes come out to be quite a lot higher than the crop than the field grown crop. So when you look at your profit margin at the end of the season, it'd be interesting to actually run out what, what comes out ahead. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like um, I've got a mate up in North Queensland, he's an organic grower and he's growing all of this stuff. But he just does it out in the field. Yep. It just happens. Yeah, he does all right. He does really well at it. He does it on broad acres. He does it on a few hundred acres. It might be worth talking to him one day too. Yeah, anyone you want to talk to I'll probably know him. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely. Um, as I said, I, I don't, I don't know a lot of the larger scale growers. I know in Victoria, I know there's, um, you know, I know Joe Scro and Joe Valenti. I know, but that's that's about it. I think there's all, all Sun. Is that all? Not all Sun. Um, IKEA, IKEA, up in northern Victoria. I don't know. Yeah. I oh, oh, Nathan Free. Yeah, Nathan Free, Nathan of course. Uh, yep. Kel- Kelvin Alkira Organics. That's Nathan. Yeah, I've got it. You can talk to him if you want. Um, we're on Flicky. His number is Sean Croft of Arahura. Um, he's good to talk to. He might swear a bit. He, he's got. He's very business minded. Uh, David Tapman at Spring Creek Organics. He's my best mate. I work for him. Um, he's in Ballarat. He's he's big and he's one of those guys that started small by himself. Did it all himself. His dad was the, actually the first organically certified veggie grower in the country years ago. They had, a, they had a bust up and David went out and started on his own in, in uh, Ballarat. And he's um, he he was in the wholesale markets a, a, in a big way, but you know, I don't think he evolved. You know, back in the day, organics was a bit rough and tumble. You could grow anything you liked. And it didn't matter what you looked like. You could be really rough and they just couldn't get enough of it and they'd just buy it for you at a good price. But, you know, things change and 
organic produce has become something else. It's more of a premium line now. So you couldn't, you can't really put rubbish in when it comes to the wholesale market. And David didn't adapt um, to that because he was remembered what his dad could get away with. So he, his wholesale business sort of imploded to a degree or became unsustainable. So he moved backwards into farmers markets, and you know that that got him out of out of the poo and. He's been doing that for a while, and he's he's going really well. He's he's an interesting fellow. He's a bit crass, but he's really interesting. He might behave himself. He'd be worth talking to. Through the Nuffield Scholarship, I've been exposed to a lot of different growers, conventional growers, organic growers, you know, grain, you name it, and it's been super eye-opening in terms of, you know, how, one, how passionate they all are, two, how they're all such exceptional growers, and three, you know, organic conventional it's amazing how all you know so all the farmers lisa i was chatting with they all have a, a very deep connection and care for the for their land which is always really um really awesome to see yeah yeah uh, things have turned change and the regenerative movement sort of spurred on a whole lot of new interest in it all of a sudden i think which is good how we, how what the wash up looks like would be interesting i know we're grappling with it at aco trying to work out what to do with it it's interesting how to absorb what the the new talk of regenerative in terms of it, it, it being a potential certified growing system to a, in to a degree um, we're trying to work out what it is and how how you can measure it and what what is it because at the end of the day um, organics is the only the only system that actually delivers a premium on the on the market where regenerative still doesn't yet but that may well change and there's government policies around these sort of things now even the Mornington Peninsula Shire is all talking regenerative the regenerative this regenerative that but what what does it mean and it means different things to different people um how do you how do you measure it how do you and maybe it shouldn't be measured and but then again how do you how do you quantify it all so, yeah, it's all very interesting. Um, you know, we've had organic growers leave us to become regenerative, which is interesting because I came into organics via the other way. I might as well buy a get a, a um, might as well get the premium. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be here farming if it wasn't for the premium. Yeah, completely. It's, uh, yeah. It's just the way it is. You, you don't enter this industry if you haven't got yourself a niche. There's, no, there's absolutely no way to do it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Wayne, for coming on the show. I've been looking forward to having this conversation for a while and I'll I'll be following your work from afar and I might even come and knock on your door and have a day out in the field with you, I hope. Yeah, no worries, mate. Look forward to it. All right, if you enjoyed that show and you're enjoying our Southern Hemisphere series, make sure to check out the show notes for all the links as well as how to follow our guests and host, Mikey Densham. Consider signing up to be a patron at patreon.com slash growers or just check out notillgrowers.com for more ways to support our work. This episode was produced by Mikey Densham. With help from No-Till Growers, big thanks to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Yeah, no drama. Just like a bit of a yak, isn't it? It's just a bit of a yak. That's all it is.